So up next, I'd like to introduce uh, Jesse Taylor from MIT, uh, particle uh, physics theorist, and he's going to tell us about uh, the hidden geometry of particles. Please, thank you. Great, thanks, much, David. Um, so I actually got a little bit nervous seeing the schedule uh, because this morning you've already heard from a theoretical physicist from MIT who works on the strong nuclear force and who's a member of the Institute for Artificial Intelligence Fundamental Interactions. And so I was thinking for this talk, how could I possibly orthogonalize myself maximally with the awesome work that Fiala showed you uh, this morning? And so instead of talking about the future and all the whiz bang things that AI are going to do, I'm going to go back in time and talk about how thinking about things through a data science lens has revealed a hidden geometry in the structure of particle collisions, something that's been with us for a half century, but we had no idea that what we were secretly doing were machine learning campaigns. So uh, as an unskippable ad for this talk, uh, I want to advertise the Institute for Artificial Intelligence the Fundamental Interactions that I'm the director of. This is a collaboration between MIT, Northeastern, Harvard, and Tufts University. And we're bringing together people from the theoretical physics community, the experimental physics community, folks from mathematics, statistics, and computer science to try to simultaneously advance physics knowledge, including some of the work that I'll be showing you today, and galvanize AI research innovation. And we're really excited to be bringing together these communities, and especially excited that we're empowering the next generation of people who are living in this interdisciplinary space. So here you have the Schmidt Fellows, who are also building these interdisciplinary connections between AI plus science. Here, our focus is on physics. And uh, starting September 1st, we're going to have nine uh, fellows in full force. And you already heard about some of the amazing work uh, by Dennis Boyda, whose uh, collaboration with the Fialis led to these amazing advances in lattice gauge theory. And if you're looking for awesome people to hire uh, at the intersection of these spaces, uh, these are names to keep in mind. And also, it's really great as part of iFi that we get to educate the next uh, generation and uh, through our iFi summer school and workshop. And so finally, returning from the pandemic, turned out that starting an interdisciplinary institute during the pandemic is not so easy. And so the first time we got together uh, uh, together in at Tufts University, it was this amazing celebratory event where you had uh, leading researchers, both giving lectures and giving uh, workshop talks, as well as spectacularly talented students whose hands are raised because they're excited about AI plus science. Uh, and we decided not only to continue this for this summer, but actually extend the length of it since there was so much interest in the interdisciplinary intersection. And for me personally, um, iPi has been an incredible way to make connections to people that I might otherwise not have a chance to talk to, again, enabled by this early career talent. And so my student, Rikab Gambier, who had a poster up at the top floor, but you didn't meet Rikab because unfortunately he fell ill before flying here. And so, hi, Rika. Uh, sorry you're not here. Your work is still awesome. And I'll try to do justice <laughs> today. Um, and then another early career researcher, Akshin Dogra, who's currently a graduate student at Imperial College London. And they helped forge a connection between two people who are secretly working on the same problem, but had no idea that they were the same. Myself, I think about jets coming from particle collisions. And my colleague uh, at Harvard, Demba Ba, does computational neuroscience and manifold learning. And you know, just these pictures look like something is similar. We're trying to cluster things. But we were staring at our equations. We had no idea how they were related to each other. And uh, Rikab and Akshina figured out that the primary objective in this algorithm, which I'll say a little bit about in this talk, was the regularizer term for this algorithm. This algorithm had a feature in it that we had no idea you could even do. We didn't know that it was allowed, and vice versa, something that you could do on the particle physics side that Demba didn't know was even allowed in terms of clustering properties. And that led to this interdisciplinary collaboration that I'll again come to at the end, uh, an algorithm called Shaper, which is a collaboration again between Rikab, uh, uh, Akshina, Demba, and then Avi Hasisa, who's a mathematician at Tufts. And this type of algorithm to a particle physicist Okay, it's just a couple of ellipses <laughs> making some clusters, like what's the big deal? But for you know, 15 years, I've been trying to make an algorithm that would behave in this way. And other people in the field have tried to make algorithms that had flexible clustering, and we couldn't figure out how to do it. And it was this interdisciplinary collaboration that made that happen. And then you start talking to your friends who are working in other areas, in particular, uh, my colleague Mike Williams, who's the deputy director of IFI, and uh, his student, Will Katumi, and postdoc, uh, Nick Nelsey. And what they realized is that the um, toolkit that they were using to accelerate the processing of data at the Large Hadron Collider, that same tool that was used for what they call the triggering system, 
turned out to be dual to the problem we're solving here. And so they actually have an, uh, another algorithm with another funny acronym, in this case, NEMO, that's trying to solve the same problem. And again, how would you find these connections if we didn't have something like I learning? And so, okay, this fancy graphic is showing uh, the attempt of trying to reconstruct the iPi logo through a series of ellipses. Maybe that's not the best thing to find for the iPi logo that looks like. Uh, but as our kind of vision comes into focus, we're seeing the power of these interdisciplinary connections. And I want to give you an example of that, but in a backward looking world way, tell you about how we could have been using AI in the past if we'd only had the shared language. I should say, just in terms of the logo, the logo can either be an A with an I next to it for artificial intelligence, or an F with an I next to it for fundamental interactions. So what's the story that I'm going to be telling you today? So the story has three parts. So first, I'm going to give you a particle physics 101. So this is going to be complementary to the story that you heard from Fiala. Fiala is talking about first principles calculations in the standard model. I'm going to be telling you, even though I'm a theoretical physicist, I'm going to be telling you about data analysis that one does with particle collision. And I'll just tell you that collider physics involves a hierarchy of inference tasks aimed at revealing the fundamental structure of our universe. Now, when you think about inference, or in the case of machine learning simulation-based inference, that's a case where AI has had transformative advances, and that could be a whole talk that I could give, but I'm not going to give that talk. I'm not going to tell you about all the amazing ways that we're using AI for inference tasks in particle physics, so that would be a fun talk to give, and I can show you psychedelic pictures, uh, but here I'm going to say, take a step back and use a technical jargon term. It's called infrared and collinear safety, so I have to define that for you. This is a technical jargon term that also has a mapping technical jargon on the machine learning side. Also turns out to have a mapping technical jargon in quantum uh, chemistry, if you want to know about that. But once we understood what that technical jargon meant, we realized, oh wait, there's a connection between the type of analyses we do in collider physics and the field of optimal transport, which you heard a little bit about from Samantha yesterday. And then coming full circle, revealing this hidden geometry, Many collider analysis techniques that were originally aimed at inference turned out to be translatable into, to my mind, an intuitive geometric language. And when I say intuitive, I'll try to explain to you in the context of some of the work that I've done, where I didn't really have a good justification for the choices that I was making for various inference tasks. But in the language of optimal transport, you kind of say, well, what else would you do? It seems like the most natural thing to do, given this new geometric construction. So that's what I'm going to be telling you about today. Again, backward looking, um, but then with a vector towards the future about the way these techniques might be relevant uh, for data analysis involving essentially clustering in general. Okay, so I need to tell you a little bit of a particle physics 101. So here is the standard model of particle physics. Um, we have the quarks in orange, the leptons in green, the force carriers in blue, the Higgs boson at the core of the standard model in purple. And if you see this pie chart, you might think, oh, you've actually seen all these particles. And the answer is that actually you've seen very few of these particles. The only ones of these particles that actually hit our detectors are the ones that carry solely electromagnetic interaction. So we have photons, electrons, and muons. Those ones we can reconstruct directly in our experiment. The rest of the standard model we've had to infer over the past half century. And uh, in particular, uh, quarks and gluons, you never see them directly. They get bound up by the strong interaction to form these composite states that Fiala was talking about. Uh, and the ones that actually hit our detectors, pions, kaons, uh, more familiar photons and neutrons. And so already at the get-go, there is no ground truth information that I can use to label parts and gluons. You just cannot see them. They are, they are masked to you by the combining properties of the strong material force. And then some of these other particles here, for example, neutrinos just sail right through your detectors. You would, can only infer them from their absence. Something like the top quark has a lifetime of a yacht second, so you can't have any chance of seeing that directly. So again, you have to infer that. So all the rest of the standard model has to be inferred. And so, not surprisingly, for inference tasks, machine learning can do a very good job of identifying these particles from the decay products and remnants of, uh, that you see in your detector. If that weren't hard enough, uh, actually, you don't see these particles coming out with labels like this. You actually have heterogeneous detectors with tracking, calorimetry, muon systems. And so what you actually have are these snapshots where you have to take these tracks and deposits, reconstruct the particles that you had, so infer those properties, then take those objects, cluster them into these bundles called jets. Jets themselves are manifestations of the underlying quarks and gluons. So you have to somehow cluster the objects, then label them, whether you think they're a quark or gluon or some other object. And you have to do this inference pass at a pace of every 25 nanoseconds. That's a large hadron collider. Okay, so like trying to make fast decisions at 40 megahertz, like, okay, that seems like a fun machine learning task. Um, 
And it's a task that I've devoted the surprising large factor of my career to. And I just absolutely love, you know, these jets, these sprays of radiation. And, you know, I can tell you that's a top part by eye. So that's an interesting pre jet configuration. You know, these are my friends. These are like uh, jets and heavy ion collisions. Okay, so this is the world of data that I live in. And inference is the name of the game. And inference is what I was focusing my efforts on for a very long period of time. So my top cited paper, um, surprising to me and many people who know me, uh, is a paper with a funny name. So I'm sorry, just say just the manifestation of the underlying parts and I can't see them very. So a funny name for this paper is called Ensa okay. This is a paper that I wrote with my first undergraduate uh, advisee, Ken Del Chobar, who's now a faculty member at NYU. And this is a hand engineered human feature thinking about the structure of quarks and gluons in the strong nuclear force and saying this beast of a feature is the way that we're going to classify, for example, objects top parts. I said the top part has a Yako second lifetime. It decays in its characteristic three prong substructure. Here are the red dots, the three prongs of radiation, and the fact that the blue reconstruction for this thing, tau three, is better than the green reconstruction, tau two. That's a signature that you probably are dealing with the top part and not some other object. So, why am I bringing up this example? I'm bringing up this example for various reasons. One is that I'm at U Chicago, and I remember giving a talk about this at Princeton, and I was yanked off the stage by people who said, This is an awful equation. You're over time. Get off the stage. We don't think that this is an interesting feature. And I remember going to the back of the room, sulking, and David Miller. Uh, said, oh, by the way, I've tested your little ends of getting this idea. Uh, here's what it looks like. And it was spectacular. And now, well, this is from a colloquium that I gave a few years ago in Chicago. We're actually seeing this observable uh, separating the background, overwhelming background of parking gluon jets in yellow from a signal of these top jets in the open histograms. And by this point, uh, and subjecting this is the standard way that jets are analyzed at the LHC. And it's surprising to me that this started project with an undergraduate has been repeating something that I'm best known for. The other reason why I'm mentioning this is that this observable has become the punching bag of the uh, jet tagging literature. Basically, people say, I have this new AI technique for identifying the spray of radiation, and it does a factor of, and I'm being serious in here, like a factor of 100 or 1,000 better than this observable. Which is maybe not surprising. This is a human engineered observable. Uh, maybe not surprising that if you throw a neural network at it and a lot of training data, you can do a lot better. And I could be showing you results of that and how, for these tasks, this is essentially as solved as you can possibly imagine uh, for a, a type of uh, inference task, of saying whether the jet you have is of a top part age or something else. But the other way, reason why I'm telling you about this is that we developed this formula. People were saying, why does you do this? Of all the things you could have written down, why that? And I didn't have a good answer. Why is that the thing that I wrote down? Why is that the way that I want to process my data? I can get, look back at historical antecedents that kind of justified that particular functional form, but I didn't know why. And the answer why, we now will see in the language of optimal transport, is that actually this formula can be have the link. It is the natural minimization, basically a distance of closest approach in an optimal transport sense, between a jet when in, in an abstract space looks like a dot, and manifolds in this abstract space that correspond to idealized um, end particle configurations. And so, this thing that seemed ad hoc that Ken and I developed uh, in the past with my uh, former students, Patrick Kaminsky and Eric Matilio, we actually realized is actually part of a more natural framework of optimal transport. And in fact, 60 years of particle physics turned out we're doing optimal transport all the time. I didn't know that. Okay, so how did you get into this world of seeing optimal transport? And our way in was similar to the way that Fiala was talking about understanding the structure of your data set. In her case, she had symmetries like gauge symmetries, um, and understanding the structure of your data set and building analysis strategies around those symmetries and structures inherent to your data set. In the case of particle collisions, one of the strong biases that we have for data analysis is that we should do data analysis that's infrared and collinear state. So this is a technical jargon for my field. I'll translate it again into the machine learning technical jargon, so maybe it'll be a little less confusing. IRC stands for infrared and collinear. Infrared is not, well, infrared just means low energy to a high energy physicist. Um, and collinear means small angle. And so what happens when you make these quarks and gluons and collisions, and they confine into these composite hadrons, and they hit your detector, is that there are singularities that you encounter when you try to perform a perturbative calculation. Those singularities 
up here, whenever the energy of some particle goes to zero, that's the infrared limit, or when particles get very close together, that's the collinear limit. And so you would like to be insensitive to those singularities. Equivalently, you'd like to minimize your sensitivity to the non-perturbative hybridization and the complications of your detector. And so to do this, what I as a theoretical physicist would do is say, I'm not going to measure the whole process here. I'm going to limit my attention to the flow of energy from the collision point off to infinity. So this is my theory calculation. This uh, E hat is a quantum operator. This is the kind of thing that I'd like John to be able to uh, compute for me, correlations of this operator. And for physicists, this operator really is the flow of energy off to infinity. It's built out of the stress energy tensor. T zero, that's the energy. I is the flow. And this is an object that's robust to hadronization and detector effects, and something that in principle I can calculate the radiation theory. Okay, so this is the technical jargon from my field. Taking this technical jargon then into the machine learning space, um, what I'm talking about is jets as being weighted point clouds. So point clouds are positions in often in 3D space. We think about X, Y, and Z. In particle physics, we're measuring the momentum of particles, that's PX, PY, PZ. But here I'm going to do it in a weighted way, where instead of talking about PX, PY, PZ individually, I'm going to talk about the direction that the particle is going. That's something that I can measure with a tracking in purple, and the amount of energy that's carried by that particle. And I treat that energy as a weight. That means that when the energy goes to zero, I don't pay attention to it. And if I have two particles that are going in the same direction, I can sum up their energies in an additive way. That guarantees this bright and collinear safety problem that I was mentioning. If you want another way of visualizing the same data set, you can talk about it as weighted point clouds, or equivalently, you can talk about it as energy densities. So I'm taking a picture of my detector, and imagine putting a photographic plate there, seeing the radiation going in, where the direction of the object is the direction of the object, and the size of the dot is how much energy was deposited there. This is my primitive. And the question is, if I know that that's what I care about, if I'm trying to process energy density, what is the suite of data analysis strategies that I should use for processing energy density? So now I've abstracted it from the particle physics world now into the machine learning world or the data science world, where now we can have a more abstract conversation. So I said that particle physics is all about inference tasks. So what do we usually do in our field? What we usually do in our field is we read observables into histograms. Every for particle physics data analysis involves histograms, histograms, histograms. I'll show you some histograms at the end. You take this complicated energy flow and you compute, let's say, one number. You take that one number, you fill it in a histogram. And then what are you trying to do with that histogram? You're just trying to infer some property of the universe. So it's a model. That model could be, for example, the strength of the strong coupling constant or the mass of the fundamental particle. But the way that you do it is you build this histogram and then I, as a theoretical physicist, have to calculate the shape and say to what extent did that histogram come from that model if I'm doing something like maximum likelihood. So here I have this histogram. Normally we don't uh, show it in rainbow colors. Normally we just show the, the, the boring histogram. But I'm showing this in this rainbow because I want you to see each of these energy flows. These are examples of the energy flow that gets put in these histograms. Zero mass in this case corresponds to these very uh, boring looking blobs. Large mass corresponds to these more interesting looking energy flows. And if you think about, okay, yes, it is true. This is the name of the game in particle physics. It's all inference, 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 histograms, 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 or if you do machine learning, you can do simulation based unbind histograms or unbind analyses. But this kind of range of energy flows up here suggests that there might be another way of processing your data. It suggests that you might want to use that directly as your object of interest. And again, this deviates from the standard way we were doing things in particle physics. We're going to take the deviation before coming back and saying secretly this is what we were doing all along. So um, in some sense, what we really want to be talking about is a density of energy density. It's not so obvious how to define this, let alone use it for inference, but we somehow want to know what's the probability distribution you like over energy flows. So you want to take these objects and somehow, instead of bidding them into histograms where you as a user have to define what the observable is, or you as the AI agent has to define what the observable is, we want to somehow treat them directly. Um, and so it was mentioned that some of these visualization strategies like TSNI are a way of having something to point at. You would love to be able to have something you could point at that actually has physical meaning where projected in 2D, you would like to be able to say, okay, this blob in gray here corresponds to 30,000 objects. And that's density in the space, except that if I were to cut out a little square, I could literally do an integral over that space and say, like, okay, I'm gonna do an integration over that density. That is, you want these distances and volume elements to be meaningful. 
And then these decorated 25 uh, examples on top are basically a way of visualizing the forest and the trees at the same time. So the forest is this whole gray blob. And then at each of these locations where this thing is, there's an example configuration that corresponds to, uh, to that jet of interest. And the size of the blob tells you how many jets look kind of like that. So we see a lot of jets look like this kind of one pronged structure. You look like this two pronged structure. You would like to make this into something that's rigorous for analysis and not just a way of having something to point out something that you can actually do you know, real quantum field theory calculations with. Now, I don't know how to do that, that would be for the future. I don't know of a rigorous definition for a density of densities in the sense of something that I know how to do an integration of, like how to do a volume integral over that. So if someone knows how to do that, please tell me, because you might revolutionize the way that we do uh, quantum field theory calculations. So maybe you are familiar about how to do that. But our friends in computational geometry, in particular, um, uh, Justin Solomon, who's a member of IPI and uh, uh, works in uh, the computer science uh, area of MIT, uh, taught us how to define a distance between densities. And this is this optimal transport that we heard about before, which I'll review for folks who haven't heard about this before. So um, we learned about this again from, from Justin or also from the computer graphics literature where it's called the uh, earth movers distance, earth meaning like dirt. And so it's literally you have a pile of dirt and you have a trough and you want to move that pile of dirt into the trench. And this has a very long history. And we learned it from computer vision, um, which comes from kind of the 1980s, 1990s. But it has a history going back to the 1780s, where it was literally moving a dirt in French. Deble is an embankment, and Bromble is a trough. And what is the optimal way of moving the embankment into the trough? This is the version of Mange in the 1780s. It comes into the modern literature under the name of the Wasserstein metric, or more generally under the language of optimal transport. And anytime you have a notion of an additive weight, it's dirt in the earth movers case, or pixel intensity if you're doing computer graphics, or it's energy in the case of particle physics, and you have some notion of ground distance that is moving stuff around in some appropriate space, that allows you to define a distance between distributions. So I can define the distance between the blue and the red distributions, and how difficult it would be to move the blue onto the red. So for particle physics, we're moving energy around, so we call this energy movers distance. It's the optimal transport between these energy flows. The blue corresponds to one jet, the red corresponds to another jet, and I want to optimally transport the blue onto the red. The black lines tell me what's the path that my bulldozers need to go in order to do that. And um, in our case, because we're not dealing with probability densities, but energy densities, we have to have a penalty cost associated with the fact that the energies might not be the same. You have a cost to move the energy around, a cost to create the energy. And this is fascinating because it gives you a distance metric on the space of events. That if you can map this into the abstract space, where this point cloud turns into a dot in the space, this blue point cloud turns into a different dot in the space. I can talk about the distance there, and it satisfies the triangle inequality, so I can triangulate the space of energy flows. And with the triangulation of the space of energy flows, I can make you know pretty pictures. Where here I'm taking three example jets taken from public uh, collider data from the CMS experiment. Of course, we have. <laughs> thousands, millions, billions, trillions of events that I could do this with. So it scales very expensively because the uh, N squared operation of got N events to compute all these uh, pairwise distances. But this movie here is showing you the optimal transportation plan and these distances correspond to the actual numbers that would come for how difficult this would be to manipulate one configuration. This is very different from the way that particle physicists usually process their information. Again, we usually do histograms. This is talking about pairwise distances, and, and there's a strict sense in which these, there is no additional information contained in these pairwise distances. Everything is computable because these objects are IAB distributed, independently and identically distributed. There actually is no relationship, yet we can define it. And once you define it, you can start doing really fun geometric things. So um, motivated by Samantha, I uh, wanted to talk about optimal transport and topic modeling. And I'm not going to tell you how the topic modeling works, but here is an example of understanding the dimensionality of this triangulated space split up into quark jets and gluon jets. So, like this plot has at least four different machine learning methods in there, uh, which I'm happy to talk about. But it looks kind of okay, like a boring particle physics histogram. Some might say this is like the anomalous dimension of some operator in QCD. Mm -hmm. But what you're seeing here is you're seeing, as a function of scale, the number of degrees of freedom inside your jet. When you're probing your jet at the scale where you made that quark and gluon, the dimensionality is zero. It's a quark or gluon is a single degree of freedom. As you start going down in scale, you get to resolve the substructure of that jet, you get to resolve the particles that are participating. So you get the dimensionality increasing. 
And the dimensionality depends on the object that you're studying. So it depends on whether you had a quark or a gluon. And if I didn't have topic modeling and I just did this directly on data, I would just be one line. But with topic modeling, I can, in an unsupervised way, pull my data set apart and talk separately about the gluon dimension, the quark dimension, and actually compare that to first principles calculations. Because this is such a well defined procedure, I can also do this identical procedure on my theory calculator. I can see an amazing agreement between data that you would extract um, from uh, from detector and the theory prediction of exactly how this dimensionality should change. So again, behind the scenes, there's lots of fun machine learning. But here, I want to go back in time and say that is what I just talked about in that Okay, so at this point, we have these two parameters, these two paradigms, two different collider paradigms. How can they possibly be related? The bottom line here, histogram of observables, this is all you should ever be doing. You can use machine learning to try to pick what observables are plot, but there really is no information contained in the relationship between the data sets. Um, and yet here I'm telling you about this triangulation of energy flows, actually imagining that they were relationships, imagining that I could talk about this abstract space. And so when our paper first came out that said, oh, optimal transport is an interesting way of talking about collider data, they said, but Jesse, you know, what you're going to have to do, no matter what, is you're going to have to take this space and project it down to some extent. But that was the key insight. The key insight is that that's literally true. That this triangulation of energy flows, you really can't think about projecting down to observables. And this actually gives you insights into the structure of these observables that we never had before. So here, you can kind of see the red kind of goes down, the green kind of goes down there. Here, this blob that I showed you here, like these type of things seem to be showing up here, these type of things seem to be showing up there, right? It feels graphically that there might be some relation. But there's actually a, a really rigorous relationship, which blew my mind, where the notion of infrared and collinear safety, this jargon that I told you about in our field, which loosely corresponds to saying, I can do a calculation of the curve of the quantum field here. Turns out that people were arguing about the precise definition of infrared and collinear safety since the 1970s. What does it really mean for someone to be safe? I had a paper that came out in 2015 where I was told, Jesse, there's no possible way that what you do could be correct. Because if you know about this paper in the, 20, in, the, in the 70s that told you that you shouldn't be able to have the functional form that you just uh, 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 observed. And yet, infrared and collinear safety in this language of this earth movers distance or energy movers distance state. Uh, really is continuity. That is, if things are close in EMP space, they're going to be close in observable space. But this asterisk is coming from the fact that continuity actually has many different definitions. You can be Lipschitz continuous, or you can be Holder continuous, or you can be continuous everywhere but a set of edges zero, so on and so forth. And the arguments in the literature that people were having about the definition of infrared and collinear safety, we had no idea how to talk to each other about it because we didn't have the language. This EMP space is the informal language to talk about different degrees of continuity. And it turned out that the type of continuity that was studied in 2015 uh, was a co continuity where you were continuous except for a set of measure zero. And it just happens to be that those sets of measure zero are the sets where perturbative quantum field theory lives. And so you have to do this technique in particle physics called resummation to actually take these stacks of different manifolds, sew them together in order to get the calculations to be achieved. So this as a formal tool, like yeah. coming from just thinking about my data structure, is very helpful for thinking about you know, calculations to do in the future. So how do you do this projection from this EMD space down to observable space? Well, you literally do a projection. Um, and so six decades of collider physics can be written in this language where what you're doing is like moving around in this space in interesting ways. So I told you about infrared and collinear safety. I'll describe in a little more detail about event shapes. Finding jets turns out to be just projecting an event down to an idealized end particle manifold. The thing that I told you about insubjectiveness is doing the same thing, but within a substructure of a jet. And even uh, techniques for mitigating noise can be uh, expressed as moving along Q physics in this EMP induced space. And again, we had algorithms to implement these ideas, but never had a unifying language. And in fact, once you have this unifying language, you realize that you know, various techniques, including techniques that they worked on, uh, turn out to have a really nice uh, 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 translation to this space. So let me give you a flavor of this connection. Um, and again, go back in time. So let's talk about just these observables, things that normally I would feed into a histogram. How do you link this pairwise distances to observables calculated by that? And the key is to use manifolds. So we have one real event, that's the event that say comes out of the detector, I'm gonna study its properties. 
Then we have many prototype events. We're going to organize themselves into this manifold again in this abstract space. So this dot is really a point cloud, and each point along this manifold itself is a point cloud. So you're really talking about a point cloud of point clouds. So it makes your head hurt a little bit. And uh, if you're someone like me who thinks also about physics beyond the standard model, each theory is a point cloud of point clouds. That is the prediction of the LHC, a different <laughs> space of all probable theories, like the space of all supersymmetric models, and itself a point cloud of point cloud of point clouds. That's really the data structure that we're working with. And each of those things has a well defined notion of transport distance in those crazy spaces. So you can talk about the transport distance between quantum field theories if you want to film. Here, just limiting ourselves to one event and prototype events. What an observable is, is just you find the line just the closest approach between that event of interest and the event on this prototype manifold that is closest to it. Right? And so this is a manifold way of thinking about manifold learning, which is quite nice. So let's talk about this in the past. So uh, Angela Linto is somewhere in the soft audience uh, and uh, her advisor, uh, Eddie Fargy, developed an observable called Frost in the 1970s. And you can ask Eddie, Eddie, of all the things you could have written down, why did you write down thrust? Yes, it works really well, but it seems kind of arbitrary. And in fact, other people wrote down other types of observables that would probe the extent to which an event looks like it has two jets. So you have a collision, sprays of radiation come out. You want to know, does it look like I have one jet going that way and one jet going the other way? In this optimal transport language, you build a manifold of all possible back-to-back -back two particle configurations. You take your event, boom, this is the closest approach. That is thrust, like is with an equal sign. And if you ask why did Eddie's method work so well, it's because Eddie's method implements a technique that has infrared collinear safety built right into it. And this is the optimal way of, of connecting an event to its uh, two particle um, uh, manifestation. And again, this ragged plot is here just to show that he's making plots of this thing forever, not realizing that it's optimal transport. Um, uh, n jetiness, which is a precursor to n jetiness, came out in 2010, and it described how n jet like an event is. So that's this distance between an event and the manifold of idealized n particle configurations. And it took us five years to convert this distance to realizing, oh, wait a second, it's not only the distance there, but actually the location of closest approach, which is a way of actually clustering things. And if we had this graphic here, it's like, oh, I care about the distance to that manifold, and I care where this, the closest approach is, or the point of closest approach is. And so there's this interesting uh, relationship between geometry at the detector level, this is a single point cloud, and then this manifold in the event space where I'm analyzing many point clouds, and these things are, let's say, you know, related or dual to each other. Okay, so you go from two jets to n jets. Why not just fully isotropic configure them? And remarkably, no one in particle physics had ever come up with an observable that could test whether a collider event was isotropic or not. But now, in this EMD language, it's pretty straightforward to do. So this is work with uh, Perry Cicerotti, who's currently a postdoc at MIT. And these are, as I promised, histograms from the Atlas collaboration. So here we can talk about whether configurations are dijet-like or whether they're isotropic by saying, how close is my event configuration to dijet-like or isotropic-like? And this observable, which is closely related to Eddie's thrust, is one for which, you know, things more or less agree between the data, which is this uh, ratio of the data that is one, and maybe 20%, 10% variations. Like, okay, you know, within reasonable uncertainties, you actually have good models of that. But then when you go to this other way of modeling the data and actually saying, you go deep into the isotropic regime, like how well are things modeled? And they're mar modeled horribly by our best simulation tools. Which is not surprising. We never had a way of probing the degree to which events are isotropic. Therefore, we didn't have a way of probing the degree to which your uh, event generators were mimicking those isotropic events. And now this gives us a target for the field to think about, about refining the way that we understand the manifestation of the So, you know, the examples that I'm showing here are, are from particle physics, um, but the same techniques can be applied to any weighted point cloud. And if you don't have a weighted point cloud, just make your points at weight one, you can use this. And this is again the connection with my colleague Dan Baba, who also was thinking about point clouds and learning. All you need to do to do this procedure is to find some parameterized manifold of configurations that you think are interesting, and then optimize the transportation costs to find both the distance, how close you are to that configuration, and then the configuration that models what you're doing. And I think as a generic um, uh, technique, this is something that a lot of people do when they're thinking about uh, uh, dimensional reduction of their data sets. Um, it's really nice to have this EMT abstract geometric picture it helps us basically instantly come up with observables of interest. 
And uh, oh, so for this, um, we, uh, this helps my team, uh, as part of iFi, developed this algorithm with the acronym shape hunting algorithm using parameterized energy reconstruction. The SHA of shaper means you're doing gradient descent, and the curve of shaper means that you're doing it on an optimal transport measure. You all can pick and install pi shaper right now. You have Python implementation of what I'm talking about. And basically, you're just saying observables are minimizing this distance to manifolds parameterized by theta. That gives you the distance, and then the theta tells you the configuration of interest. And so I can tell you how this is used uh, in practice if you like during QA. Um, but in terms of movies, this original three sub JDS that David helped make me famous for, uh, we can do this gradient descent and find the same as the my algorithm sound. <laughs> but now you can do something else. You can say, okay, what are collider events really? Because you look at this collider event and there's kind of a spray of extraneous radiation that's kind of annoying. And then you actually see that it's not really three, there's like this extra kind of elongated uh, configuration there. Wouldn't it be nice if we could actually learn those structures? using some machine learning enhanced method. And again, you just do gradient descent and say, look, I actually think there might be a uniform background of contaminating radiation. Let me learn that. Let me also learn shapes that go beyond just dots, in this case, ellipses. And you see that it's learning a little bit of ellipsiness for these clusters and then elongated shape here. And there's a formal sense in which this is a twice as good of a reconstruction. And I can show you how this can actually be used to enhance the reconstruction of software. I'm told that my time is up, um, which means that I can only flash the next slide to say that not only is this EMG a really great avenue for thinking about uh, analysis and analyzing particle physics data, but it's also a generative model for acronyms. So, uh, yeah, soon this pile of inference and radiation annihilation. Nice. Uh, and here, what you have is you have novel perturbative physics. This is the thing that I do not know how to calculate, meeting hungry piranhas. So it turns out you can think about optimal transport as like laying a bunch of hungry piranhas and then like a certain amount of radiation. I am previous, and this is something that's important for reducing the difference between calculations done in quarks and gluons and calculations done in a positive space in the strong force. So if you don't do this, then the plot in black uh, showing you the deep distortion that you get from non perturbative effects. In blue is the best technique that I knew how to do back in 2014 using a cut based way, like scissors trimming away my guess. But if I unleash these hungry piranhas at it, you get this incredibly good reconstruction and actually uh, mitigates this non perturbative effect in a way that we think is quite exciting. Okay, so with that, I need to uh, wrap things up. So let me just summarize the story for you again. Collider the physics involves a hierarchy of interest tasks. That's definitely true. But it's also useful to step back and say, hey, what's the structure of my data? And if I impose this inductive bias of IRC safety, we realize, oh, wait, our data structure is well uh, understood in the language of optimal transport. And then coming full circle, we're realizing that optimal transport has secretly been this hidden geometry that's been behind the next 50 years or the past 50 years of collider physics. And the hope is that it's going to have some relevance for the, for the next 50 years. And then, uh, as one final ad uh, for our AI Institute, um, you know, progress is being driven by early career talent with interdisciplinary training. So, here is some of the people's work you've seen here. On the one hand, we're seeing artificial intelligence as a pathway to scientific insight. And in my mind, artificial intelligence is really the front of space of data science, mathematics, physics, computer science. It doesn't need to be a neural network to have a transformative impact on the scientific field. And similarly, kind of physics intelligence, thinking about the structures of our data set, have a pathway towards AI innovation. And you've been asking in the QA why my colleague Deb Abba thinks this work is interesting. I'm happy to tell you more about that uh, during the questions. Thanks so much. Questions? Just got a very simple technical question. So, as uh, far as I know, uh, the distance is relatively expensive to compute. So, yeah. I'm going to go around right you. And you said that this ideally would be in an online fashion in yeah. the accelerators. So, is that an issue? Uh, it's not an issue. I can get my slides back because the secret thing that I put in there. So, the um, well, the answer is that we're using synchronous approximation to to to, to processing, and that so the, the the level at which you need to do it is not actually quite twenty five nanoseconds. For some offline analyses, you would have something like a millisecond, and so this thing runs in that runtime. So if you did the direct EMD, super expensive, the synchronous approximation, you have to now dial what your level of approximation you're willing to tolerate. And what's really interesting is that we found this trade off between. Um, the floating point precision and the synchron uh, 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 control parameter. And you actually need to think about that when you're thinking about the computation. So if you're doing this on a GPU, 
uh, turns out that numerical precision starts to become more of an issue than the uh, than the synchronous approximation as the certain regions of things that are very interesting. Right. Yeah. Oh, great. And so that that was just uh, in the uh, in the in, in the fine print built on the synchronous approximation. So you are emphasizing data analysis, but we could also look at or move your distance as a guide to the uh, QCD perturbative field theorists, what's the safe variable I should be computing? So you gave the example of thrust and then jettiness, you know, you could, it turns out you were smart years ago, yeah. but are there also surprises, like things that the soft collinear effective field theorists wouldn't have thought of that they should have been computing? Uh, yeah, uh, so here's my psychedelic slide that I just get. So the, the thing that people forgot to do was plot things on a log log plot. Okay. And so if you're a net scatter physicist and you think about phase transitions, plotting things in log log space make a lot of sense. But here, just pairwise correlations, like a two-point correlator between these energy flow operators, no one ever thought to plot that in log log space. And so you actually see a phase transition between a protonic and hadronic region of phase space from this. Okay, so that's one example. And this is kind of a goofy one. This one is uh, where you just can change your axis definition. This could have been discovered in the 90s, maybe even earlier. Here we're doing with LHC data, we have this beautiful phase transition between perturbative and non-perturbative. Or you can take insight from our cosmology friends. Our cosmology friends study the sky and look at multi-point correlators. It's actually a poster of looking at multi-point correlators uh, uh, up there. Um, and you can actually try to study the sky in terms of the non-galaxy entities that you might get from these energy flow operators. And so these are cases where you can get inspiration from condensed matter or inspiration from, um, from cosmology. Thus far, the EMD itself hasn't given us a direct inspiration, but this is why I have my, my collaboration with Demba. I'm, I'm expecting that he's gonna say, oh, of course you do this. Here's a topological thing you can do here, something else where I'm gonna be surprised and get insights from active entity. But there are other ways where once you abstract your, your data structure, you can see connections to other fields that might not have been otherwise apparent before. Um, have you tried to reformulate what you do in a in a Bayesian sense? Because it feels like there's there's very nice connections between uh, sort of a, I guess minimizing a KL divergence if you use the Gaussian distribution um, and uh, Earth mover distances, uh, but then it's very attractive to think of it as an estimation problem where you basically have prior. So each might by the way also. Help you defining measures on distributions. Good. So that's an excellent point that priors might be helpful in order for us to define these these, these entities. Um, what you just described was the first attempt that I'm aware of in particle physics to get these more elliptical shapes. Um, and so they were using the KL divergence as a loss, and it just didn't work very well. And it wasn't clear why it wasn't working very well. And um, so, so I, I don't know, and maybe it's worthwhile to kind of come back and revisit that paper through this new lens. Now we have something that does work, which, as you said, is very frequentist, right? I'm finding that like the, the minimum is like, like doing the maximum likelihood thing. Well, maybe I would actually benefit from thinking in a more Bayesian way and actually having some sort of prior. And what I liked about this idea is that one thing that we haven't encoded here is the actual structure of QCD in detail. I'm taking just the single limits of QCD and building that thing. We actually have a lot more domain knowledge about QCD. Maybe that would be a way of building the prior that could help us. So it's an interesting idea. We haven't done it, but that's something for, for good to thought. Thank you. Last question. Thanks. Okay, I'm super excited about all the possible connections. Um, although without knowing more particle physics, I'm trying to translate a little bit about how we could use this. So I have two thoughts, and they may not make sense. One is, um, I mean, we are trying to learn nanopoles from point clouds, and I think about point clouds and point clouds all the time, actually. Um, but I'm wondering about how much you know about the relationship between maybe what you would think of as a real underlying manifold, you know, parameterized by things you understand versus the point clouds you get, because I don't know a lot about the noise. We pretend to know about how that gets generated, but I think there's a lot we don't know. Could we, could we use those techniques to actually learn those parameters, or how do we think about that relationship? That's good. So uh, this is a case where we are benefiting enormously from our, our domain knowledge. Um, and in particular, one of the things that we said about our noise, we uh, estimated it in uh, in this graphic here, we're saying that the noise is uniformly distributed. 
And you say, well, how well do you know that the noise is uniformly distributed? And I can tell you to what order in QCD expansion I actually know that the noise is really uniformly distributed. If it's not uniformly distributed, then this gives you a bad guess about what's going on. So we're, we're benefiting a huge amount from our domain knowledge. Um, partly where this started off with, 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 uh, with, with Dembo is that he was able to learn much more uh, intricate structures, but then he had all these failure modes. Here, we control against the failure modes. It doesn't fail. It always gives you a reasonable answer, but then you can't learn the more intricate structures. And so there's this mm -hmm. kind of trade-off between how much you impose the domain knowledge and, and how dynamic things are. And we would all the way to be super well-posed you know, direction and I'm hoping that Denville will kind of bring us back into a kind of have a more dynamic way of, of learning that might reveal you know, other types of structures. But right, right now, this is all very much domain knowledge-based. A really quick follow-up was um, very, it's technical, but you mentioned this energy penalty term. Yes. Um, I just wondered, again, like I'm trying to think about how we would estimate something like that because that's related to sort of the proliferation or something, right? You don't necessarily have the same um, and so how do you, how important is that? How hard is it to get that right? Well, from, from a domain knowledge perspective, this is relatively straightforward, okay. um, but from, no fair. but, but for, for an optimal transfer perspective, there's a whole field of unbalanced optimal transport. And basically this is corresponds to unbalanced optimal transport. And so the extent to which you know what's going on in the unbalanced data, that's the extent to which you can figure out what that penalty term could be. Thank you again. Right, thank you.